Thank you very much, Mark, for a very, very generous introduction. I think you should all know that uh, when I took up my position at the University of Sussex way back in 1978, Mark had been teaching there for two or three years and he became a good friend, a mentor, and a source of major support for me throughout my career. And you, you've heard some of that tonight. I'll never live up to the billing that he's just given me, but I thank him very, very warmly for those wonderful remarks. And I also thank um, Dean James Donald for this invitation um, to the University of New South Wales. It's a great pleasure to be here and to, to be meeting you all tonight. Uh, I appreciate the fact that you've come in on a wonderful uh, Sydney evening where the sun is shining, the temperatures are balmy. Um, it's very, very good of you to spend this time inside with me. So on this journey, which of course, in some ways is a, is a, um, a distressing journey. Um, uh, the idea of discussing mass atrocity crimes and so on, which is what we're going to be doing. Um, I like the idea of this so what uh, question. Um, it forces um, it forces students of international relations and other topic areas to really think about why they do what they do and, um, and how they can uh, spread their ideas more widely beyond the academy and the like. So I very much appreciate this, this, this initiative that you've uh, introduced uh, at UNSW. But I hope in a way that the importance of this topic isn't in doubt. Um, um, uh, uh, I mean, James Donald's already mentioned that, that this is in, in many ways a significant real world top topic. And I think it's particularly significant in 2015 um, because if you think about it, this is the, the, the 20th anniversary of the, um, uh, the massacre in Srebrenica where 8,000 Muslim men and boys were killed and buried in, in mass graves, and there will be things said and written about that this year. It's the 40th anniversary of the coming to power of Pol Pot in Cambodia, which of course led to the death of some two million Cambodians, either from d disease or they were executed and the like. It's the 70th anniversary of the end of World War II, and we all know, of course, about the associated mass atrocities that uh, were part of that war, um, and we watch seemingly powerless today as hundreds of thousands of people um, are caught up in conflict in the Middle East, none more so than Syria, where um, the estimate is that we're now talking about 225,000 people having lost their lives in, in Syria. Um, and uh, it, Libya, of course, another uh, crisis area. The intervention in Libya was, in fact, under the R2P banner. And so that, again, gives us reason to pause and think about uh, how R2P operates in today's global um, uh, scene and what we need to learn from those lessons, given the outcome of, uh, of the Libyan um, crisis. Um, so in these circumstances, if we think about these anniversaries, if we think about the killing, the mass killings of uh, civilians, um, we have to wish the idea of R2P rather well, I think, um, and hope that some states mean it some of the time when they say that they will do all they can to prevent uh, mass atrocities from occurring. Um, and of course, these states agreed this in 2005, so we're at an important 10-year moment they agreed in, at this high-level plenary meeting of the General Assembly, some 150 heads of state turned up for this meeting in September 2005. And um, I'm going to talk about some of the things that they agreed and before I actually go on and talk about China in reference to this. So um, paragraph 138, absolutely crucial. Um, the responsibility to protect populations from these four crimes, genocide, war crimes, ethnic cleansing, crimes against humanity. Um, the other thing I would say about um, the so what question before I go into the um, R2P issue in more detail is that an idea such as R2P relates to broader issues of global governance. How do we organize the collective challenges that face us in today's world? And this is a particularly tri tricky area because it involves questions of state sovereignty. 
it's a, it's, a, it's a particular view of sovereignty that's bound up in the R2P idea. Um, and and um, state sovereignty in its traditional form, of course, has been one of the building blocks of the modern international system of states and so on. So for IR scholars, R2P is a very important idea that they need to reflect on. They need to think about how an, uh, an idea like this gets onto the books, how it actually gains tra traction, how it is implemented in individual states and the like. Um, and we need to think about whether ideas such as this are subject to a kind of linear progression or whether indeed you may get setbacks to the idea. You may get forms of reinterpretation of the idea, which maybe the originators would see as a setback. And I'll have more to say about that when I get onto the China section of the talk. And if I think about why we need to think about uh, China in relation to all of this, it's partly because um, obviously, China is a member of the UN Security Council. It's a permanent member. It has veto power. So when questions um, of, uh, that, that affect international peace and security come before the Security Council and may involve, indeed, mass atrocity crimes, then China is centrally involved in taking decisions about whether to veto, whether to vote in favor, whether to abstain on these, on these questions. The other thing I would say about China is that um, it has a very traditional view of state sovereignty. Um, in other words, that state order and uh, states are the building block of the international system. But on the other hand, because of its UN Security Council membership, it's had to debate these questions about whether sovereignty should be interpreted somewhat more flexibly and whether we should actually care about, as an international community, whether we should care about saving strangers in another state. And uh, I wouldn't like you to go away from tonight's talk without understanding that there are those, indeed, inside China that do debate these questions and come up with different positions in, in, in the end. Um, I, I, China is uh, important, I think, for another reason, and that is because it's been, if we think about um, humanitarian intervention ideas and then the concept itself of R2P, China has been present as a sort of more involved member of the international community all the time that these ideas have been subject to debate and uh, evolution. And, and so it's not one of these questions in global governance where the Chinese can say, this is done without us being involved. This is done at an era that predates our involvement in international uh, relations more, more thoroughly. And so this is a moment for international relations scholars to study the evolution of an idea such as R2P and to look at the way in which a major state such as China um, actually deals with it. And we also need to know, I think, um, why China has taken the positions that it has taken in reference to Libya and now more uh, contemporaneously with the, in the question of Syria. Um, because as you know, the Chinese, alongside the Russians, have vetoed a number of resolutions in connection with the Syrian uh, case. If I give you a quick preview of my argument, it's that states like China, over the period since 2005, have reinterpreted R2P um, in ways, I think, that move us from the notion that we as an international community, we as individuals should be concerned about protecting the individual and towards a notion that we have to think about state primacy. We have to think about the state as being the primary vehicle for protecting the security of the individual. So it's a state's responsibility to protect its population. Um, from wide-scale abuse. And I think what underlies this position of Beijing is a rather paternalistic view of the state. Um, and it, it translates into a position where um, it, it would argue that humanitarian outcomes are best realized through state-led economic development. So there's a sort of an economic turn to its particular view of our R2P. Um, I'll, I'll go into that in a bit more detail um, later on. 
Let me say something about R2P characteristics before I get on to the China case. I would say that R2P at best represents a form of soft law, um, and it's, it's, a, it's an idea, it's a concept that's nested with other powerful norms in global politics, such as, as I've already mentioned, the idea of state sovereignty or the idea of sovereign equality of nation states and nested with the idea of non-interference in internal affairs as being again an important building block for global order. And it's often said about R2P that it was endorsed unanimously in September 2005 at this, this plenary uh, General Assembly meeting that I referred to at the beginning. Um, and the states um, at that meeting agreed that each individual state has the responsibility to protect its populations from the four crimes, but the idea that there was a strong consensus behind these paragraphs is in some senses a bit of a misnomer. Um, it masks what was in fact a much messier um, and a more contingent process. And so that opened up possibilities for states like China and others to actually shape the trajectory of this particular R2P idea. Um, and so um, those that originated, I think, had a very, originated the R2P idea, had a very strong sense that we ought to care about saving strangers. But I think what's happened is that we've moved away from that um, as, as the years have gone by. There was a lot going on apart from the R2P question when um, we um, think about the September 2005 World Summit outcome uh, document. There were, the R2P was certainly part of that agenda, but there were massively important questions such as reform of the UN Security Council, or should we replace the UN Commission on Human Rights with something like a UN Human Rights Council? Should the UN set up a peace building commission, which it decided to do? And there were questions about reinterpreting the UN Charter with reference to use of force. This was particularly controversial after the Iraqi intervention in Iraq in 2003. And this meant two things with respect to the future of R2P. It meant on the one hand that some states were concentrating on other topics than R2P, but that those states that were particularly wary of R2P were able to do a lot of work in, in shaping its early um, um, trajectory. So states such as Egypt, Pakistan, Algeria, India and so on, they were very wary of the idea of R2P, seeing in it um, a breakdown of this idea that other states uh, should be able to interfere in, in one's internal affairs and actually arguing in many senses that by maintaining this constraint on the ability of others to interfere in internal affairs, that that would be um, a break on um, a, a system that was likely to result in more um, conflictual relations between the Western developed world and the developed developing countries and so on. So the norm that was arrived at in, in September 2005, I think, is a very complex one. Let me just put some of those details up. Um, you can see we're talking about protection against the four crimes. We're talking about collective action through the Security Council. We're talking about a case-by-case -case basis. And we're talking about action only when authorities manifestly fail to um, protect their populations. Now, of course, if you think about a phrase like manifestly failing, then you realize that that's the kind of formulation that's going to invite controversy. It's going to invite delay. It's going to invite debate about when it can be taken to be a manifest failure on the part of a state to protect its population. Um, the article, one, uh, sorry, the paragraph 139 also notes that they would be prepared to take collective action on a on a on a case by case basis, and that and again that represents that was a formulation that means there would be no automatic triggering of action. They would consider each case on its merits, and they would be prepared to take, but they would not actually take action of various kinds. 
And it also calls on the international community um, to help states build capacity to protect populations from the four crimes. Um, not obviously a very sensible and very good idea, but again, it was putting the emphasis very much on what we could do to help states rather than what we could do to protect individuals. The norm itself over time has come to have three pillars associated with it. Um, this was a formulation that was developed in 2009 by the then uh, UN Secretary General. Um, again, with the states having the primary responsibility, pillar two about international assistance to build state capacity. And then the third one was about a timely in international response if a state is manifestly failing. Um, now, these ideas, again, um, were thought of at the time to operate in tandem, but what's happened, essentially, as these ideas have been debated and talked about and as states have added their voices to that of the UN Secretariat, is that they've begun to think about these as sequential. In other words, you start with the idea of pillar one, it's the state's responsibility, only if they're manifestly failing. You, you think about ways in which you can help build state capacity to prevent abuses from uh, occurring. So if you think about by the time we get to 2009, we've got a decision that it's a veto-ridden body, the UN Security Council, that is going to take a decision on a case-by-case -case basis. It's a very qualified phrasing, I think, prepared to take action on a case-by-case -case basis. And a, a tendency to see these three pillars as essentially um, sequential, um, with pillar one being actually a consensus position in the global system. This is where most states have ended up. They're very willing to talk in terms of to use the language of states having primary responsibility to protect in UN resolutions of various kinds, but it, 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 it means that the debate is essentially around what the state can do and what a state-ordered global system can do. Okay, so I think this gives me, if I just quickly run through that, that's pillar two and pillar three. It gives me some um, indication um, this particular uh, progression of the norm of R2P gives me a better idea of why China, in the end, did not block the development of R2P entirely. Um, as we led up to the um, 2005 World Summit Outcome document, the Chinese were actually more concerned about other things than R2P. Um, they were concerned about the replacement of the UN Commission on Human Rights with the UN Human Rights Council. There were various design issues that they were interested in discussing. But they felt that they could leave it to other states such as Egypt and Algeria and Cuba and um, India and Pakistan and others to actually help to shape the language of R2P at those, that important uh, meeting and at that lead up to that meeting. China liked the idea that there would be no detailed criteria covering circumstances for international intervention. Um, they liked the idea that this was about a case by case basis. They weren't alone in this, so did the United States prefer that, so did Russia prefer the idea that there would be a case by case, there would be no uh, criteria developed for, for intervention. Um, they liked the idea that the UN Security Council would be recognized as the authoritative decision-making body. Um, and so in those circumstances, and because, again, there was a move that regional organizations would, and their particular perspective on whether there was a R2P type situation developing in another country, because those regional organizations would also be brought in alongside the UN Security Council to take action, to decide on action and so on. There were various layers that were put in place that allowed for a more cautious interpretation of R2P. Um, in fact, it was regional support that, um, allow, that, that uh, persuaded China that it could abstain on the critical intervention in, in the, uh, to do with the no-fly zone in Libya in, in 2011. The composite, the, the three-pillar 
idea associated with R2P was also of particular interest to the Chinese because, again, as I've suggested, it allowed them to talk a lot about states having the primary responsibility to protect populations. Um, and it has made use of the, uh, what is in many ways a fiction that the World Summit outcome meeting and document that was a, a arrived at in September uh, 2005 was based on a very broad consensus to say that there should be no going back on those agreements that were reached in September 2005. In fact, those meetings were, as I say, much more controversial. Let me try, um, how am I doing on, on the time? Not too badly. Um, I draw on um, some ideas about um, state's reaction to R2P and try and situate China's own position within a broader consensus of ideas about R2P. And I'm going to look at four my main objections that have been articulated uh, by states in the period since R2P's initiation and development and to examine the Chinese case uh, for the position it has taken on R2P against these four objections that one can arrive at if you survey a large number of state positions uh, in, in the uh, UN debates and so on. So some states, first position, some states are very worried that they will become the target. It's an obvious concern. They will become the target of an R2P type case. And so India, for example, was concerned about that and thought about that in relation to the Kashmir issue. And that explains some of the wariness that, that India, for example, has um, uh, taken in, with respect to R2P. The argument, again, was always that it would be the developing world that would be on the um, receiving end of an R2P type operation, never the developed world. And that led into a debate about double standards in world politics. The, the notion that it would always be the powerful West that would be doing the intervening and that the others would, if you like, suffer the results of that intervention. So there was a sort of fairness argument that was developed here. Um, there's also an unwillingness to, counter, to, to countenance intervention because there's a strong association with the idea that that intervention is going to take a military form. Even though UN Secretary Generals and other uh, members of the UN Secretariat have tried to say that pillar three involvement by the international community in an R2P-like situation does not necessarily mean a military intervention that it could mean mediation, it could mean, um, um, as in the case of Kenya, it could mean capacity building for states, it could mean um, sanctions, it could mean a whole range of things. But the association of an international community response with the idea of a military intervention was something that was extraordinarily difficult to break down, that particular um, perception of, of um, a pillar three type action. Um, the fourth position is that, and it goes back to something I said at the beginning, that R2P in many ways represents an attack on norms that others have found extraordinarily helpful for their position in global politics. So for example, if you move from a kind of a horizontal system of sovereign states where there's a kind of a legal um, fiction in many ways, but a legal idea that we are all equal as sovereign states, if you move from that to the notion of a more hierarchical system where you get, uh, a, if you like, um, con conduct that's subject to oversight by powerful others and punishment perhaps by powerful others, if you move away from sovereign equality towards this more hierarchical system, that that is extraordinarily dangerous for, for global order. Um, and of course, many states, thinking about their colonial pasts and so on, would fear that breakdown of that kind of sovereign equality of nations concept. So there were very clear and, and in many ways, reasonable articulation of concern about R2P as it developed. And I think we can actually test these ideas 
against China's stance. Um, and I would say that they've all influenced its own position on R2P. But I wanted to add something to that. I want to highlight, uh, and this brings me back to the, to the title, I suppose, and that is um, the leadership beliefs about, this, about the supportive relationship between the state, development assistance, and humanitarian outcomes. And I'm saying that these local beliefs, if you like, these local China-centered beliefs about the state and the relationship between state and development and outcomes, humanitarian outcomes, is also part of, of why it's taken the stance that it has uh, with respect to R2P. Let me go back, first of all, though, to the four um, main objections that have been made um, about R2P and give you some idea of how the Chinese have argued across these four dimensions. Uh, first of all, would it be used against China? Now, China has not um, suggested that it would be subject to an R2P-like uh, operation. But nevertheless, there is a fear, quite clearly, with respect to potential outcomes in Xinjiang or in Tibet or other parts of the country that there could be, a, a, if not an intervention, certainly some criticism of China, uh, as it happened after the Tiananmen crackdown in, in June 1989. That crackdown, of course, led to Western sanctions against China for a period, for a period not longer than about a couple of years. But nevertheless, there was a, there was, so there's a sense that it would be targeted, not in terms of an actual intervention, but it would be targeted in terms of perhaps a shaming exercise something that would damage its international reputation and image and so on. The second theme that comes up a lot in Chinese discussion, of course, is the idea of double standards in world politics. And this is very much standard fare in Chinese descriptions of international relations more generally, that it's the, it's the strong West that decides on which issues will be taken notice of and which will be ignored and it's countries like China and others um, that would be the targets and so on. And because of those concerns about double standards and because of that particular perception of global politics, China is extraordinarily concerned to protect the, the notion of sovereign equality of, of, station, of nations. As a former victim, of course, of Western colonialism and Japanese imperialism, it has very good historical reasons why it would be concerned to protect the state sovereignty norm and the idea of the sovereign equality of nations. And it would extend this argument these days to make the point that we ought to respect diverse civilizational and cultural tra traditions and that the best way of, of protecting those different traditions is through a pluralist state-based order, not through the idea that uh, of a universal principle of protecting individuals and the like. The Chinese have also made strong arguments on consequentialist grounds. In other words, they've said that Pillar 3 is about um, military intervention, essentially, um, although I don't think that's the case, but they've made that argument. And they say that those military interventions that we have experienced, that we have seen, the outcome of these has actually so often been worse than the, uh, the reasons why the intervention occurred in the first place. So they would put the emphasis very much on mediation, on trying to bring warring parties together and other peaceful means in response to humanitarian crises. And so they criticised the Libyan intervention in 20. 11 on exactly these grounds, that this was something that was supposed to be limited in uh, intent, it ended up as being about regime change, and it certainly has not left the country in a better place than was uh, the, the condition in 2011 when the intervention occurred. So um, it, dialogue and negotiation is so much about uh, the Chinese position on these particular crises, including the current Syrian crises. Um, so it's not good uh, at responding to the crisis element in, in these particular cases when there is mass atrocity crime occurring. It's not good. It thinks in terms of mediation, which of course is difficult to bring about. It thinks in terms of building state capacity 
which is a long-term um, focus. And it talks about um, um, the way in which it is, it's the strong state that is less likely to engage in abusive behavior. So it's about a preventive mechanism, as far as the Chinese are concerned, but a very long-term preventive mechanism. So on Sudan, for example, the argument they would make there is that aid for economic and social growth is absolutely vital for dealing with poverty and resource shortages. And they argue that the genocide in the Sudan is to do with poverty. It's not to do with um, the decision by those in authority to engage in mass atrocity crimes. And in UN peace operations as well, you find that um, the Chinese don't participate um, in those parts of the operations that deal with rebuilding institutions such as rule of law mechanisms or human rights institutions or holding of democratic elections and the like. They engage very much in infrastructure development in, uh, in these states in which they're involved in UN peace operations. And they are involved in many UN peace operations. It's one of the things that they should be applauded for and it's one of the things that they are very proud of. Um, but it's very much a developmental focus that they have engaged in in these UN peace operations. Um, so the central long-term objective, as far as the Chinese are concerned, of peace building is um, through the building of infrastructure, whether that's schools or roads in particular, clinics, and that that will change the relationship between a government and its society. Um, and so they are then moving to argue that there's a causal relationship between development and domestic peace. Um, so the next question I ask myself is, well, how well anchored are these ideas? Is this all about instrumental logic, or is there something in the Chinese um, belief system that would help to anchor these ideas more deeply? And I think um, one can see it uh, in many ways in two forms. First of all, in reference to Confucianism, the idea that the successful emperor was one that dealt well with human and natural disasters. So the idea that the, it's, the, it's, the, it's the authority at the top that actually has the responsibility. And then, of course, later on, China's own developmental experience. I mean, the Chinese are rightly proud of having brought something like 500 million people or more out of poverty. And they are um, believe that their society, which has undergone wrenching social and economic change, over these last 30 years is more peaceful as a result of the economic path that they chose, which has involved a lot of uh, infrastructural uh, building of, of various kinds. So focusing on poverty, they believe, has brought beneficial outcomes in terms of their own society and that they've managed to hold together a very diverse society at a time of very rapid social and economic change. Um, let me just check again um, at the time. As I said at the beginning, there are alternative perspectives in China. One of the things that we have learnt to expect over the last decade or so is that there are debates about these questions. And you will find, particularly among scholars, but even among some officials, debate about whether China can really hold to this particular view of this, uh, that we operate in a state-based system, or whether they actually do have to modify in some ways their, their understanding of the concept of state sovereignty. So you do get a minority perspective inside China that would argue that the idea of sovereignty has changed and that China itself has accepted that as it's over the years, it's signed up to numerous human rights treaties, um, it's taken part in numerous debates about human rights related issues and so on. But the dominant view <coughs> is very much this fear that the state-based order will in some senses come under too great attack if we allow R2P to have free reign um, and to be and to think about, as I say, um, the the if you like the protective individual protective elements of R2P rather than the state-based elements of R2P. The Chinese local beliefs then, based on this rather paternalistic view 
of the state as the, I guess, as the moral agent. Um, it's these sorts of ideas that are influencing their position on R2P and help to anchor it. Depart I mean, of course, there is instrumental argumentation that's going on here, but nevertheless, the sense that they themselves understand something about social and economic change within diverse societies, within conflictual societies, has helped to anchor this particular approach to R2P. And again, as I say, they will emphasize very strongly that we live in a pluralist state-based world as far as they're concerned, and that that would better protect China, but it would also better protect other states within the system. And they make the point that um, if we're interested in really promoting uh, harmony within societies, then you, you, you do think, need to think about this through a development lens. And so development assistance in many ways gets conflated with the idea of humanitarianism inside China. So I would say that the Chinese are policing the R2P idea in many ways in order to reinterpret in the direction of the state and to reinforce the idea of state um, uh, sovereignty. There are various problems, of course, with this Chinese position. Um, there's no discussion that I can see at the moment, although this may change over time, about the tensions that are involved in building the capacity of a state that is involved in repressive action. You know, if you build better roads for a state, um, that's wonderful on, at one level, but on the other hand, that makes it easier for that state to send its security sector into various uh, troubled parts of um, the society in order to engage in uh, mass atrocities. There's very much the emphasis, obviously, in what I've said, on the elite level, on um, the governmental elite level, and not on non-state civil society um, as authoritative actors in this debate about who needs protecting and how societies best should be protected. Um, so it raises questions about the legitimization of policies and it raises questions about the extent to which these policies are truly inclusive of others in, in these particular states. And I think it also misses the fact that um, its own societal experience, of course, has been much more conflictual than this particular depiction of change over the past 35 years allows for in, in, in many ways. A final point is that R2P should also apply to non-state actors. Um, it's not just states, of course, that commit mass atrocity crimes and security sectors that engage in these crimes. It's also the non-state actor. And there's very little in the Chinese response to this R2P idea about how we would deal with that and how we would actually um, respond in these kinds of circumstances. So I think, in summary, where we are with um, R2P is that we are at the point where the international community, I'm not keen on that phrase, but I can't think of another one at the moment, that where the international community can reference the responsibility to protect and does reference it in UN Security Council re resolutions on a, on a regular basis. There are now something like um, nearly 30 UN Security Council resolutions that refer to R2P. Um, so we're at that point where we can say, yes, it is a state's responsibility to protect its people from mass atrocity crimes, but we're not at the point where we can agree on what common courses of action should be with respect to mass atrocities. And that's why, in many ways, Syria has become such a, uh, a, a sad and tragic case of mass atrocity crimes. So thank you very much for your attention, and I look forward to questions and comments.